All right, welcome to the Viz Art Podcast, the business of art. This is episode number three. We are here with David Light from Lightworks. David, welcome. Thank you. Yes, very excited to have you. So I always say you are the king of wholesale. I mean, you have been doing wholesale for a while. I think you're one of the best in the industry that I know as an artist. Um, but on top of it, your jewelry is hands down one of our top selling jewelry artists in our gallery we have. And I just want to know more about it. I want to share kind of some of the the secrets on how it got to where it is and just let people know how this began. So can sure. you kind of walk me through uh, how this got started and how you started creating this jewelry? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is our 15th year and about 15 years ago in May, I was... Um, you know, making glass jewel. I was making glass artwork. I was making sculptures. Okay. I was making a lot of the bigger stuff. And um, when the economy started to go down, I started to make more of a, I want, I, you know, the, the sculptures sold, but we wanted to get them in a place where it was more consistent and, you know, take hours and hours to make these sculptures. And then if they sold then great, and if they didn't, then I was kind of stuck. So I started making uh, the sculptures smaller until eventually um, I was making paperweights and I was selling them at the local farmer's market. And I had like an assortment of pay, uh, paperweights and I was writing on them with a little Dremel, you know, Bob and Sue forever. And, um, you know, just, you know, different names and customizing the paperweights with the Dremel okay. on the spot. And um, uh, a girl came up to me and said, you know, hey, can you take one of these paperweights, these little like drop paperweights, like big bulky thing. And uh, can you drill a hole in it? And I said, sure. And can you make a new pendant? And these couple of girls next to me were making wire wrap pendants. And so they were like, you know, this is how you do a little wire wrap and you put it through the hole and then you make a pendant. So you put it on. It was just like, whoa, that actually looks really good. And then wow. she, and then and then furthermore, then she bought it. So, so that, it started all from the farmer's market on yeah. how you got into the jewelry. Exactly. Let's back up a little bit. So you went to actual art school. You went to art school in uh, in Washington mm -hmm. uh, by a school that was founded by Dale Chihuly. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like what made you go into the art school and what yeah. you were doing in class and what they were teaching you there? Mm hmm. Um, so back when, you know, all throughout high school and all throughout school in general, I've always, my mom taught me, you know, um, if you ever, there's no, there's no mess ups. There's always like, you know, you can always make something, just keep going, make a, make a, make a piece look good. But so I was always was really, I was always just loved art. And so, um, I went, I got A's in art and always just excelled in art and everything else was just kind of on the back burner. So I loved art. And as a graduation present from high school, my mom, um, it paid for me to go to um, the Pilchuck Glass School, which was founded by Dale Chihuly. In Washington. In Washington, up in uh, northern Washington, outside of Washington, in Stanwood. Um, and there's like three huge, I mean, at the time I didn't know this, but there's like three huge schools for glass art in America. There's there's Corning Glass Museum in New York, there's Pilchuck in, um, in Washington, and then there's Penland. So my... And also at the same time, my aunt was the executive director there oh, at wow. that school. And so she was like, you know, friends with Dale Chihuly. We're all friends there, you know. So you've met Dale. So I met Dale. I've been to his house. Wow. I've had, you know, I did not I've, know that. I used didn't to know have him. a towel signed by him, you know, <laughs> all this stuff. Like he, um, he kind of showed me the, like he showed me around. He gave me my first tour of the school and like, you know, and then also, you know, my aunt as well. Um, was very instrumental, you know, you know, getting me into the school because it's a kind of a very prestigious school. So I was one of the youngest artists to go to that school. That's incredible. And uh, I got a training from a guy named Mark Taylor who taught me how to cut and polish glass. Yeah. Uh, Dale Chihuly, real quick, for mm -hmm. people who don't know that name, who right. is Dale Chihuly and what is why is his name so important? So Dale Chihuly, he's probably like the he's like the Michael Jordan of glass, huge name, you know, basically known for his huge installation pieces in the Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and San Francisco and just these Vegas, huge I mean, Vegas, Vegas, the Seattle, ceiling of I mean, uh, yeah, the Bellagio. Yeah, yeah Bellagio. You, see, you go into Bellagio, you see these huge sculptures, really, really. Uh, uh, elaborate sculptures but he's also known for just being a businessman sure he's known for um taking um basically the art industry hiring people to work with him and to, he has a vision he's like a producer he's a he's an artist designer producer he takes all his work and he makes a vision he hires all these people it's kind of like building a house he's got the floor guy this roof guy all this stuff Brings he builds these together. huge million dollar sculptures installs them in places and then opens them up for exhibit so I've always seen that example as like, you know, an option, a vision, yeah. hiring people, making Completely. your work, 
expanding it out and uh but having the vision so he is kind of like one of the most successful people in the glass industry absolutely i mean his name he when i opened the shop i didn't know much about glass but that name kept getting brought up over and mm -hmm. over again because we carry these glass flowers in our shop yep. and everyone thinks those are chihuly we sell them for 149 if those were chihuly they would be about 10 grand at right. least right. i mean exactly. it's, it's crazy how yeah. you could attach that name to it but he is he is the michael jordan of the glass and so for you to be able to know him and go to his school and learn from the best. I mean, mm -hmm. it shows in your jewelry and, and what you're doing. And I can kind of actually see now that you brought up how he functions. I can actually right. see some of that in you how that on works. how that works. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into your jewelry. So yeah. what is Lightworks? What, what is making your jewelry so unique? So what makes my jewelry so unique is that a lot, so I take this technology developed by NASA and, and it's basically the process of heating metal so hot it creates a iridescent film and, okay. the, and NASA used it for their shields or space shuttle um, for, the, um, for the shields of the astronauts and the shields of the capsules when they re-entry, it doesn't blow up. It basically de deflects heat. And you can wear this. <laughs> and it's, right. And so what happens is it creates also a unique, beautiful prism. And a lot of a lot of jewelry people will put the, the they'll kind of coat their jewelry, you know, titanium, they'll put these kind of similar oxides on the jewelry. Um, but what makes mine very unique is that I layer it inside and I don't, and when I put it together, I don't heat it, I don't fuse it, I basically cut it. And so it keeps it in its pure state and it gives it a unique look. And it's a very laborious process and most artists don't go through that. It's called cold working and that's what I learned from Pilchuck, you okay. know, my original training, which was how to cut and polish the glass. A lot of, a lot of artists learn how to fuse and blow and those are a little bit more exciting you know, mediums, you know, blowing glass is really fun. It's a production. It's huge. It's awesome. Um, cutting glass is a little more tedious. It's really labor intensive, not as sexy, if you yeah. will, yeah, as definitely. the blowing glass. Um, so I got, I really honed in on a product that people weren't making. I mean, there's a lot of jewelry out there with yeah, this, like you consider cold working on one of your videos I yeah. watched the other day, cold working, um, and that there's only a few artists in the country or even in the world right. who actually are doing that. Right. And exactly. that's because of how labor intensive it is. And right. You've got to have someone teach you the right way to do it. It's exactly right. And, and there's a lot, it, 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 you can mess up very quickly and it's, it basically ruins the whole thing. And so to keep them even, I've always been uh, enamored by, you know, simple lines, clean, simple, elegant, you know, just pure form versus uh, there's a lot more artistic um, options in the world and a lot more, you know, abstract things. I like pure form and and I've always tried to keep pure, simple, elegant in my pieces, you know, not distracting a lot, making the person the center of attention, this just being a splash of color. And I think when that girl put that piece on, it was like light bulb moment wow. just like boom simple. this is it boom yeah yeah because i mean it does it changes color with movement skin tones what you're wearing right. especially once the light hits it i mean it pops i mean we put your jewelry in the window and i mean it pulls more people in just because it literally looks like there's a battery behind mm -hmm. it they can't figure out why it's lighting up the way it is but it's because the titanium or that metal is reflecting through the glass or the um crystal what's the difference between glass and crystal so the difference so there's the difference between glass and crystal crystal is just like crystal clear like there's no impurities in it you take it all out so there's definitely different types because there's natural crystal there's optic crystal and then there's just crystal okay um, uh it basically if you look at glass and you look at the standard glass or beer bottles things like that they'll have this kind of green tint to them when it's crystal, it's kind of very, very clear. Gotcha. It has no no color to it. So, you've been selling this for f 15 years. Your Lightworks jewelry. Mm -hmm. um, what got you into selling wholesale? Because this is definitely yeah. where I know a lot of people are interested. How do I go from selling retail, selling to farmers markets? I mean, that's where I met you. I met you at the farmers markets. I met you at shows. We've done a lot of shows together. But now it's hey, let's take it to that next level. Mm -hmm and do it to the way that you've done it. How have you been able to grow the way you have? So it's pounding the pavement, really. It's really showing up. Completely. It's, you know, when I, Chris Matthews was my commencement speaker in college and he said, if you want to play, if you want to play the game, you got to be in the arena. And so the arena for wholesale is wholesale shows. It's going to Atlanta, the big ones, New York, uh, Vegas. These are the big ones that are, are now. When I was starting out, it was San Francisco. LA. It was also LA. Yeah. There was a lot of other ones. But showing up in that arena, um, you basically have to have a line. You know, you have to have a line. You have to have a consistency. The most important part about being an artist um, is consistency. And as a painter, you know, you get a, you, you can do a great, you know, as yourself, you know, you can great, you can create a master, you can create a piece 
and then you can reply, you can copy reproduce it, reproduce it, yeah. reproduce it. Yeah. As a as a sculptural artist, and, you know, and a jewelry, you have to have also figure out a way to reproduce it at high volume, and then be able to produce that consistency. And then you know, then there's other things like breakage, and you know, and uh, color quality, and 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 um, making sure the designs are exact. You know, quality and consistency. And so once I was able to figure out a way to do consistency, then I created a line, and then I signed up for these shows. There's overhead to the shows. And then um, you have to, you know you need the booth, uh, you need to have the tables, the, you know the drapes. Figure out everything that goes with it. And they're not expensive shows, but yeah. that's part of the process. It's part of the process is putting it all together. Yes. And then having the display and having the presentation, having the handouts, having all that. So so it, it, it didn't happen overnight, and no. there's obviously a lot of learning. You, know, sure. you have to show up. And I think you know, um, at first I had an idea of like you know I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make it. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> I'm just gonna show up. People are gonna buy everything. I'm gonna yep. be done. But you know, it's it's different. You know, a wholesale show versus a retail show. A retail show, lots of people come. Wholesale show, it's kind of like a bunch of stores come. Yeah, and they're, they're the buyers. Stores. They're yeah. the owners. They yeah. have that. You know, I mean, real quick, I have yeah. a quick story. When I did my first wholesale show, or actually, I did. Uh, I used to do LA wholesale shows yeah. to test it out. They were okay, but I wanted. I went straight for the best of the best of in the greeting card industry. I went to the National Stationery Show in New York, thinking like, oh my gosh, like you just said, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be my big break. I'm going to get into all the top companies. Well, we spent all the money, brought everything over there. When we walked away from that show, I was way out of my league. I did not come back with one order. Wow. And it was because they want to see people coming back regularly. One of the other vendors said, don't be down. A lot of the times they don't buy from people until they see them three times. Mm. And it's because they want to make sure that you're you're serious and you're coming back. And right. you like you said, you got to be in the court. you got to hit the pavement. Mm -hmm. So... It took us following up with all of them. We've got orders in, but it's not as quick and easy as just jumping in there and be like, hey, I'm here, now let's make some money. It right. doesn't work like no. that. You gotta keep hustling and that's where you gotta lick your wounds. Mm -hmm. You gotta get up and you gotta keep moving. Right. And I think a lot of people are scared of that or they just don't know how to do that. And that's where right. you're either gonna make it or you're not. Right, Yeah. and you have to be and you have to be flexible. I mean, a lot of stores come in and they're like, ooh, we're not sure, and, I, and me too. I'm like, I don't know if drop earrings are gonna work or studs or whatever. I don't know what's, I don't know what's gonna work in their place. Sure. And so for me, I'm always like you know just give it a shot and we're here you know we're open to suggestions we're open to um changing our policies different display different options and over the you know for the last 14 years it's morphed into kind of knowing what people need versus kind of this collaborative process of figuring out what people want yeah. and that's huge and it's being open as an artist a business artist anyways i mean there's different types of artists sure you know but as a business artist you're in the pro you're, you're in the in the business of making money you know so you're you want to make money for your customers and you want to make money for yourself and you want to make money so you can pay your employees because i have employees and i have always yeah you got a pay. great team you yeah got you got a great team, team. And, and i think you got that you know. from chihuly like seeing how he operated right. and like hey exactly. it makes sense how right. to build your own chihuly dream team right you have to you have to have people you can trust you have to have people who are consistent and and um and so over the years of figuring out what people wanted uh product wise and um and just you know just different aspects figuring out what people wanted also helped me then um kind of hone in on what and, and develop what what how to the business you know would you say wholesale is 50 percent of your business wholesale is probably 75 percent of my business wow so that's point. i think that, really more turned over i think over. that's incredible because yeah. i mean right now where i'm at between the shop the shows online wholesale is maybe five or ten percent because wow. i haven't gotten back into it you yeah. have to hustle that right. industry because once i opened the shop i had to cut back on the wholesale side of it because i can't be out there all the time so and most artists i think i think if you're doing over 75% in wholesale, that's a whole nother level because I don't think most artists are doing that. I mean, you've been right. in it for 15 years, you've found out what works and you're running with it. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that's probably where you see your business going. Where do you see your business going from here? Yeah, it's, it's you know, with a kid on the way. Yeah, and, you know, congratulations. Family. Thank you very I much. I mean, yeah. good thing you got this 15 years out of the way because it's going to get harder from here. Well, that's the thing is, you know, as an artist and, you know, it's tough. It's not, you know, they don't say starving artists for nothing. You know, it's, right. it takes consistent <laughs> hustle until eventually you can form a system which then works um independently of you but also bigger than you Absolutely. and so for me wholesale was that avenue because if you 
when you set up those channels of distribution, you can then be more in one place versus going out everywhere. I mean, at one point in my career, and for 10 years, I did about 80, 85 shows a year. Yeah. Farmer's markets, yep. street fairs, fine art festivals, all that stuff. And so, that's where I was yeah. seeing you. I was doing right. over 200 shows a year, kind of trying to set up, yeah. figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Right. I was doing five to six shows, and I would see you at half of those shows. Right, right. I'm and like, I, who's this yeah, guy? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and as we get, and as we get older, the shows aren't getting any easier. No. So they're it's getting like, more expensive. Right. They're getting, you know, it's not getting any. Yeah. Easier, like you know that I used to clear out my van in an hour. Now it's like two hours. <laughs> right, right. And then, then the and the the glory days of you know hundred thousand dollar shows before Amazon and before all these internet stuff are kind of long gone. And it's just, the, the the landscape has really changed. Even in the wholesale wholesale landscape, I mean a lot of a lot of um, buyers are going online and finding new products online and and um, and are just kind of going with what they know. And yeah. so it has, in the, even in the last 10 years of doing, and I've been doing wholesale maybe for 12 years or 13 years now. Um, but I, my first my first big retail show was actually here on this corner. I was telling my wife here earlier that the first show was right on the train tracks over here. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. So I was driving home, and I was thinking, wow, I could just do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, these shows are tough. And yes. so then I went to the Zardoon Wholesale, and then, yeah. And that's where a lot of people, that's one of the biggest things. How do you get your name out there? Get out there and do yeah. shows. Yeah. Put yourself, put mm -hmm. your product out in front of people. Yep. They're going to give you feedback. You're going to see what works, what doesn't work. And it's basically doing that same thing in the wholesale uh, wholesale side of it in that mm -hmm. arena is doing that same thing. Put yourself out there, see what right. works. Um, you brought up, I asked Gil, uh, he's 90 years old, the same question. Yeah. You brought it up. What does starving artist mean to you? Who? Starving artist. Well, I think it has to do with the same question of what is success to a person. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think the I think starving artist to me means that you are um, it, it, that you don't make enough money so you can't eat. Sure. I mean, uh, sure. Is, is the the plainest way of putting it. Yeah. But if we go back to the conversation we had on you know being a flexible artist or what type of artist are you? Are you an artist for the art? Um, are you willing to um, say this is what I make and I don't care if anybody likes it? Yeah. Um, and willing to starve yourself out? That that I think I think the true artist is making something that you are tr truly passionate about and you don't care what other people think and then you starve. And it's um, not for the money. Yeah, it's, it's not for the money. It's not you're not doing art right. for the money. Versus you make things that people want. And then you evolve to what people want, and you stop making what people don't want. Because, I'm, like I'm sure you yes. never thought you were going to be making jewelry, but right. you realize, hey, this is people what like happened, it. And, and it makes this, people happy, yeah. and people tell me how many how much compliments they get, and, and they, you, you don't know, have to starve. Right, I don't have to starve <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Nice. Um, was there a moment you thought uh, you were going to fail? Hmm. Like, is there any time that you remember, like, you're like, you know what, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do, or I'd maybe say, I need to get out of this industry? Yeah, I'd say, well, when I first moved to San Diego, I just made the Google logo uh, for at a glass, okay. and I, you know, had that chunk of money from them, and um, as, again, as the economy started to wane, I started making smaller sculptures, and I was, me and my roommate at the time were eating, you know, uh, we were buying you know, meat and making making dinner every night, and we were like really just hunkered down watching Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune every night, not going out. Really top just, ramen, top ramen, <laughs> really nice. just really th th uh, slim, thin rather for like six months. Okay. And then as it, you know, as it, the jewelry started, it it turned back around. So there was that low moment where it was just like you're questioning yourself. I was yourself. kind of I was willing to do anything. <laughs> and like, so let's and jewelry, just make this I'm this hockey player, or surfer, or whatever, willing to do anything. And so jewelry was. I never thought I'd be a jewelry artist, and at the same time, I wasn't sure what I was doing. I just wanted to be different. So I mean, you started off as a typical glass artist, making pipes, making. I mean, did you ever get into that side of it? You know, it? that was tough. I mean, pipes and all that were really tough because there's people there's people that do them and all they the do time. them really well. They do them great, and they and they're willing to go to festivals and they're willing to really i mean that's a when you when you're in a business where there's a lot of people doing it there's really a lot of competition sure and so i did i did school i did sculptures i did fruits vegetables flowers i did kind of um uh, pumpkins i blew glass pumpkins but i think ultimately you know in pipes and things and but ultimately there were people that were good at that and i didn't really want to compete against that so i had to find something well you're in a tough industry to sell jewelry is, right. i mean that's they even don't allow jewelry artists in certain shows because yeah. there's so many of yeah. them. So, I mean, you went from one to another, which I think this one might even be harder because there's so many jewelry artists out there. Yeah. 
but you have you put yours up against a hundred other artists, yours is going to stand out because of the colors, the, the color. vibrancies. I mean, that pulls them in. So yeah. you found your niche, which yeah. is incredible, well, um, and it is you know trying to. It's, it's experimenting. It's being open to try new things. I, yeah. I think is is really where. You I, was know, very, I was very grateful. I'm very grateful and uh, and I'm fortunate to have found something that's that that worked. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know when I created it. And again, it was that light bulb moment where I was like, wow, it just and it evolved. It always wasn't. You know, it yeah, it's took, like how could time. you know you were going to make this or do this? Like, I had no idea. It's, it's it's playing around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what what are you scared of as an artist and a business owner? Um, failure. Always, yeah. still really scared of failure. Scared of not uh, progressing year by year. Um, every year, there's the challenge to keep growing. I mean, I feel like if you're not growing, you're somewhat dying. Sure. And uh, and to get more galleries and to have better product and more consistency, and um, yeah, the, the fear of uh, the fear of failure. You know, and that's the number one reason why people fail is mm-hmm. they're scared to try and they're scared to fail. Yeah. So. You know, for you, it's crazy to hear that out of you because you are successful at what you do. You've been mm-hmm. doing it for 15 years, but you're still scared to fail, right. which is amazing. That is something that's always going to live with you, I think, because mm-hmm. um, so people who think they're going to get over it real quick, it doesn't work like that. Like, you know, right. you've got to just go through it, bust through that door and not not let that hold you back. Because if you're going to let that hold you back, you're not going to get anywhere and you're going to be talking about what you wanted to do for your whole life. Right. And there was that moment. There was that point in my career, I think about four or five years ago, which is like, I wasn't really doing really, I wasn't doing inventory. I wasn't really, um, I didn't have the base of a business. I wasn't really, um, taking really, it serious? The QuickBooks. The, I wasn't taking, I mean, I was taking it seriously, but I wasn't setting up the fundamentals for success. Okay. The, the QuickBooks, the, um, you know, I had an accountant and I was, you know, doing all everything properly, but I just, wasn't um, really identifying what sold, what didn't sell. I was just kind of, and I didn't have like um, inventory management software. There's just a lot of, what else was there? There wasn't a great website with all the SKUs and I didn't have SKU numbers. Okay. And so for the last four or five years, I've really just trying to focus on the base of a company. SKUs and, and barcodes, which is a new thing last year, which is like, you know, if you want to get to the next level, yeah. you always got to keep, I mean, if I want to keep growing, I want to get to the highest level. You got to keep adapting. And you got to have, you got to have barcodes, you got to have SKUs, you got to have uh, inventory, you got to have packages, you have to have display, you have to, have, there's a lot of different things. Well, that especially for you, time. you have so many different colors and options. Yes. I mean, one yeah. necklace can actually have 20, 12, th- yeah, excuse 12. it seems yeah, like. Right. I mean, you have all the colors, polished, frosted. So mm-hmm. I definitely see that. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to start a business? Pound the payment. Yeah, go to the farmer's market. Yeah. I, I, I've always wanted Big to write a book. in that. Huge believer. <laughs> I've always wanted to write a book called The Farmer's Market Effect. And basically, you know, showing up. Showing up to the market. Showing up where people are. If you're shy, what better place than to have people come to you? Exactly. Why go to, why go door to door or extend yourself out and, and just hope? You need, you need... You need data points. Yes. Data data is huge. Um, my uncle always used to tell me data is the most important part of the business. Understanding what's good and understanding what's bad and understanding how to fix the bad and make it into the good. Um, and by going to a farmer's market, you get you get real people. You get mm-hmm. real people who are going to tell you how they think, better or worse. Good or bad. You know, a lot of people <laughs> came up and said, what is that, CDs? What is this? I could get this at Walmart. And I went, great. Where? Oh, yeah. Let me, I'll get it too. You know, but, you know, everyone has their own opinion of stuff and, and to take that. It can be a little frustrating, but also, you know, you got to be there. And it's going to thicken your skin. Yeah. You're, you're going to get thick skin. I mean, you're going to learn mm-hmm. that you, it's easy to blow things off. And I think you just got to get in there and take the beating because it's going to be a beating for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And then you work out those kinks, right. change things up every time. And if you go consistently, I think that's also half the battle because mm-hmm. most of the people, even mm-hmm. if they show up once or twice, then they're gone. If you just outlast everyone else who is coming and going, you're going to be successful over time because yeah. everyone keeps seeing you. So if, yeah, get to the farmer's markets. For those people listening who are asking, how do I get into this industry? Go to a local farmer's market mm-hmm. and start selling and seeing what people like and what they say about it. Mm-hmm. And you can tell real quick if this is something you want to do or if you don't want to do. Right. A lot of people, a lot of people as artists will say, you know, my friends think it's so great and everyone tells me how great I'm yes. doing. Well, unless they buy it, it's, you know, it's it, it could be really great. But there's different types of art. There's there's art that people... Um, uh, that wouldn't don't care about it at all then there's art that people are giving away yeah then there's art that people would just you know that won't even take it and there's people that will take that free art then there's people who will, will pay for the art there's different levels yeah until you get to a place where people are willing to pay you for it 
Especially if they don't know you. Especially I think, if they don't know I you. I think that's key. Yes. If they don't yes, know that's you. That's a huge thing. That's yeah. huge. Yeah, because if your family and friends are buying it, mm-hmm. they might be buying it to help support you and because they like you or whatnot. Right. But once you start buy- selling it to people that don't know you, it always amazed me that I get a lot of people, artists coming into my shop asking if we would sell their artwork. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, where else do you sell it? Well, oh, I don't sell it anywhere. I mean, I give it to friends and family. So I'm like, let me get this straight. You won't sell your own work, but you want me to sell your work that you don't even have the confidence to do that or that you just you're giving it away for free, but you want someone else to sell it. Yeah. Like you got to figure out what your price points are. You got to figure out your best sellers. You got to f- see what works before right. you start having other people selling your yeah. work. And as you know, as a store owner, it's not easy. No. You don't want to fill your, your store full of stuff you don't know it's going to work. Yeah. If you don't know it's going right. to sell, we got to make money. I mean, maybe you take a chance and you're like, this is really awesome. I'm going to try it because you love it so much personally, but every store owner is different and you might not like someone else's art who's like amazing who's like selling this like who's sell, selling out you might not like it so you might not give them a chance or you might like it and it just it's a lot harder of an approach well and you yeah. you nailed it with doing farmers market because in our shop we feature 20 local artists all of our artists do street fairs festivals and farmers markets mm-hmm. they do i do that for a reason because they got to get out there making sure that they're taking it serious that they if they're willing to sell it then i you know am willing to take a look and see if it's worth bringing in but if you're not willing to go that route and get out there and sell it in front of people then i don't feel like i should be taking that risk either right i mean so that's how i look as a business owner as a gallery owner my first thing is where are you selling it are you out there hitting the pavement Mm -hmm. um and you got yeah, having skin in the game. In you essence. have to have skin in the yeah. game, yeah. and that's why I've I've much respect for the artists out there doing it because it's not easy. Mm-hmm. You're taking your weekends, you're leaving your families. Yeah. It is there's shows where you might not even make money. Right. You're losing money on the events. You're losing your time, and for you to keep going, that's what it, it it's about. And right. you know, and just hustling and right. moving forward, figuring out what doesn't work and what works. I, I try to tell people that all the time. And again, listening to those cues, like a lot of people will uh, tell you that um, they like your work, but unless it, unless and, you know unless it's selling, then it's really not. That yeah, it's, it's not there. Yeah. Well, David, man, uh, you know I love having you here. I've known you for a while. Yeah. I've seen your business grow. I've seen. I even remember having seen some of your sculptures you used to make. Yeah, I mean, it's time. cool to see the transformation, and yeah, seeing your skews, your new website, incredible jewelry, incredible artists. You know, thank you for taking the time to yeah, come in anytime. here. Anytime. And, you know, that is the business. We had David Light here. You can see his website, or he's also on our website. Um, you can see the the Instagram, the Facebook that you have. Really check out this jewelry if you listen to it on, on uh, online because it's incredible. Or come in. Thank you, and we're out. We'll see you next time.